satisfaction and thank thank you both Luis and Pablo for all the incredible advice and, and support all of these years it's been a great pleasure to to work with, with both of you and also thank you to the members of the committee and, and Alexis as well for for your time and, and being here today okay so my dissertation is divided into two main parts the first part is about elliptic transmission problems and today I will give a brief introduction, <clears throat> explain some of the history and, and application, and then I'll discuss two of the problems that we have worked on. So the first problem is for harmonic functions, excuse me, <clears throat> which is the problem that I explained in my candidacy. So today I will present an overview of the main results, and I will focus most, most on the second problem, which is a transmission problem for fully nonlinear equations. And then the second part, it's about a new family of interdifferential operators, and they are motivated by non-local Montampere equations. And I'll present uh, the geometric construction of, of our operators and some of their properties that we study. Maria, our slides are not, are not going through. They're not moving? No, not on Zoom. Oh, no. okay, let me try again. They cannot see the slides. Uh, so we can see them here. So let me stop sharing and share again. Okay, uh, let's see. Can you see them now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so this is the outline that you missed. Thank you. No problem. And let me minimize one thing. Okay. So can you see them now? Part one? Yes. 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 Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, so let's start with part one. What is a transmission problem? In general, transmission problems describe phenomena where some physical quantity, which is the unknown, completely changes, changes behavior across some, some surface that it's known as, as the interface. So for example, suppose that we are at this beach and we want to model how the water from the sea flows through these two different types of media, right? So we have sand here and large gravel on the other side. And so what we will see is that the water increases velocity when it crosses from the sand to the, to the large gravel. Also, you can see here that the interface, it's known a priori, and it's a separation between the two different types of media. A little bit about the history. Transmission problems were first introduced in the literature in elasticity theory around the 1950s by this Italian mathematician, Mauro Picone, who mostly worked on PDEs and calculus of variation. Picone's problem modeled how to glue together two elastic materials, okay, one of them is pushing the other and vice versa, prescribing some compatibility condition here on the, on the touching surface, sort of like a pressure balance condition. And then the following years, Leon Stampak and Campanato made significant contributions to Picone's problem, such as uh, exist and unique regularity of, of solution. In 1960, Martin Schechter generalized the theory of transmission problems to elliptic um, equations, linear equations, in this case, in non-divergent form, with smooth coefficients and smooth interface. And then in the 1960s, there were several variations studied, for example, the, the so-called diffraction problem, which can be understood as models of equations with discontinuous coefficients across the interface, in this case, in divergence form. For example, you can think of, like the name says, the diffraction of light. So we have a smooth object, like, like a ball, then the light wave will change direction as it hits the, the ball. So in, in this topic, there's several works by, for example, Ole Nick, Ladies and Sky Ural, Sema, Borstuk, and many others. And then the theory of non-smooth interfaces started around the 1970s, when mathematicians started to wonder, well, what happens if you don't have a smooth object, but you have maybe an object with like a corner or like a cast, right? And uh, this is a theory, for example, of Lipschitz interfaces. There were many words in this line of research. So here I, I cited a few. Also in the early 2000s, um, transmission problems arise, for example, in the study of composite materials. There's the pioneer works of Leo Gelius and, and Nirenberg. And in the last decade, there's been uh, some interest in studying local non-local interactions. Uh, for example, there's a work by Krivenso, who was a student here of, of Luis Caffarelli, or a work by Caffarelli di Pierro and, and Baldinocci. Okay, so this, uh, this is a little bit the, 
an overview of some of the applications and, and uh, the history. Now, what is the problem? The first problem that we study, this is a, a problem for harmonic functions. And it's a joint work with Luis Caffarelli and, and Pablo Stinga that was published in, in ARM at the beginning of last year. So the geometry that we consider is, is the following. We have omega, a smooth bounded domain in our end, okay? And then omega plus is a subdomain compactly contained. You can see here in the picture, omega minus is the difference. And the common interface is gamma, which is the boundary of omega plus. Nu is the interior vector that's pointing to, to omega plus. Some notation for a function u defined on the closure of omega, we denote by u plus and u minus, u restricted to omega plus and omega minus respectively. And the problem that we study is we want to find a continuous function u such that u is equal to zero on the boundary of omega. Okay, so here outside is equal to zero and such that u plus and u minus are harmonic in omega plus and omega minus respectively. And the difference between the normal derivative, okay, of u plus and u minus is equal to some function g that's given on the common interface gamma. This condition is known as the transmission condition uh, condition as it describes how both u plus and u minus interact through this common common interface gamma. Okay, now um, some remarks. For example, when when g is equal to zero, uh, it, one can see it's not easy to it's not hard to see that u is harmonic um, in all of of omega. Okay, so the problem becomes trivial if g is identically zero, and so really the, the interesting thing happens when g is not zero. Right, in that case we have a jump between the normal derivatives. So u globally is not going to be differentiable at those points, okay? <clears throat> and the idea is to study their behavior close to, close to these points of, um, close to these singularities. This condition is uh, in, the, in the same spirit as Schechter work from the 1960, um, but Schechter considers smooth interfaces. And here, uh, one of, the, of our main novelties is that we only consider gamma to be a C1 alpha interface. Okay, so what that means is that gamma is locally the graph of a C1 alpha function. Our main result is the following. So assuming that gamma is a C1 alpha interface, G is C0 alpha and non negative, then we show that there is a unique classical solution that is globally log Lipschitz of the, the transmission problem. And moreover, from each side, u plus and u minus are going to be C1 alpha up to the, up to the interface with the following control of the C1 alpha norm. So the C1 alpha norm is controlled by some universal constant that only depends on the dimension alpha and the interface and the Helder norm of, of the function G, okay? Now, the condition that, oh, yeah. The condition that u is equal to zero on the boundary is actually not a restriction. And we can replace it by a more general Dirichlet condition of this type, just by subtracting to u the harmonic function with boundary values equal to five, okay? And really here, uh, like I said, interesting thing is to study or to show this estimate uh, at points close to the interface, because away from the interface, these are harmonic functions and we know they are smooth, so they, they behave really well, okay? So the main difficulty and, and interesting thing is to show the C1 alpha estimate up to the interface. All right, the notion of solution is understood in the weak sense and it's motivated by this computation, okay? So formally we take a test function phi and we compute the distribution at Laplacian of u. Just by an integration by parts argument, we get that the distribution at Laplacian equals to this integral. Okay, so this is the integral over the interface gamma of the difference between the normal derivative and times the test function. And we're prescribing this to be G, okay? So this is what we get. And so taking this into account, we say that a continuous function that vanishes on the boundary of omega is a weak solution if it satisfies this equation in the distribution alpha. Okay, now you see, <coughs> excuse me, this is a Poisson equation with a right-hand side that's a measure supported on gamma. So, Using classical techniques, we can show that solutions can be represented using Green's function for the Laplacian in the domain omega, and omega is smooth, so we have nice estimates for the Green's function. We're able to show some um, log Lipschitz regularity to start with. Okay. And, and so the next step is to, to try to improve the regularity 
um, of you coming from each side of the interface. Okay, again, globally, we cannot, um, solutions are not differentiable, so uh, we cannot expect to have more than lipids. And this is the precise result, assuming, for example, that the origin is, is on gamma. If you use a weak solution of the transmission problem, G is bounded and Helder continues at the origin, then we show that U plus and U minus are C1 alpha at the origin in, in this sense of, of Campanati. So that means that there are linear polynomials, L plus and L minus, such that they approximate U with this uh, error decaying as mod x to the power one plus alpha. And now you see here, for example, the, the um, gradient A plus and A minus corresponds to the gradient of U plus and U minus at, at the origin, okay? And B is the value of U plus at zero and the value of U minus at zero, but it's equal because they coincide on, on gamma. And D is the C1 alpha seminorm of U, okay? So all of these quantities are controlled by the C1 alpha seminorm of gamma and the function, uh, essentially the Helder norm of the function G. And now the global C1 alpha estimate, so our, our main result, follows by, by a standard argument of patching the interior estimates for harmonic functions and these point-wise estimates at the interface. Okay? So very briefly, what is the strategy? The idea is we can approximate U by solutions of flat interface problems. So these are problems whose interface is just a plane, hyperplane, okay? And these problems are nice because in this case, we can decouple them into two Neumann problems. So we know that the regularity, we know that they will be C1 alpha up to the, up to the plane. And so using that, just by, by a kind of like a scaling argument, we can transfer the regularity of this solution to flat interface problems to our function U, okay? Now, this strategy also applies to different types of equations, and I will explain this in more detail with uh, the, the next problem that we'll start. Okay, so the next problem that we study is a transmission problem for fully nonlinear equations. And this is a joint work with Paolo Raul Estinga that uh, we're finishing the, the last details, so we will submit it soon for, for publication. So here the, the geometry is a little bit uh, different. Gamma is, is given by it's the graph of a function psi in the vertical direction, okay, in the en direction. And we split b1 minus gamma into two domains, as you can see here, omega plus is the domain above gamma, and omega minus is the domain below gamma. And this is the problem that we study. So here we have on each side, or in the interior of each domain, we have a fully nonlinear equation of this type, okay? And then the transmission condition, it's the same as we considered in the previous problem. So it's, it's a Schechter type transmission condition. Now, what are the assumptions? We ask for the fully nonlinear operators to be uniformly elliptic, okay? So that means that they satisfy the, the usual identity uh, inequalities. And here, nu is also the, the normal vector pointing to omega plus. So I, I didn't draw it here, but it's pointing to omega plus. And u nu plus and u, u minus are the normal derivatives of u plus and u minus. Also, the, our main assumption is that gamma is a C1 alpha interface, meaning that psi is, is, is C1 alpha, okay? And our goal here is also to, to try to show that both functions u plus and u minus um, from each side of the interface gamma are going to be C1 alpha, okay? That's the, the expected regularity. Now here, uh, one of the main differences besides that the equation is different is that we allow the operators from each side of the interface to be different, right? So before we had two, two Laplacians and now we allow them to be two different fully nonlinear operators. So here in this case, uh, we cannot integrate by parts. So the notion of solution is understood in the viscosity sense. So what that means is for example, we say that use a viscosity subsolution of the fully nonlinear transmission problem. If whenever we have a test function psi that touches you by above at x naught, so what that means is that they coincide, phi and u coincide at a point x naught, and it lies above u in a neighborhood of the point. Okay? Then the following holds. If the points are in the interior, 
the, the test function satisfies the usual sub solution inequality for the interior equation. If the point X naught is on gamma, then the test function satisfies the, the usual sub solution inequality for, for the transmission condition. And then similarly, we say that U is a viscosity super solution. If whenever a test function touches from below, these inequalities hold with the reverse sign. All right, a few related problems. So we know the Neumann problem is, is related to the transmission problem. And for the fully nonlinear equations, we have that Milaken and Silvestre for flat boundaries, they show that viscosity solutions are at C1 alpha. And this is in the case where G is a Helder function and F satisfies as well some, some conditions. And then Lian and Zhang in, in 2018 extended their, the results for more general C1 alpha domains. Another closely related problem is a work by the Silva Ferrari Salsa in 2016. So they also consider a fully nonlinear transmission problem, in this case for flat interfaces. The equation is the same, but the transmission condition changes a little bit. So here, instead of prescribing the difference between the normal derivatives, they prescribe that um, one normal derivative is a multiple of the other, right? And this is more in the, in the spirit of, of diffraction problems rather than, than the problem of Schechter. Here, I wanted to point out that existence of viscosity solutions is not proved in, in their paper. And they show, um, assuming they have a solution, they show that uh, viscosity solutions are C1 alpha up to the interface. <clears throat> Excuse me. Finally, a third related work. It's a fully nonlinear free transmission problem. Here, the word, the word uh, free means that the interface is not known a priori. It depends in the solution itself. And for example, Pimentel and Santos introduced this model where they have some fully nonlinear operator in the positivity set of U, another fully nonlinear operator in the negativity set, and then the transmission condition arises uh, naturally from this global equation. Okay? And here I, I mentioned a few contributors contributors to, to this theory. So what is our main result? We assume um, gamma is a C1 alpha interface, G is C0 alpha. The right-hand side of plus and F minus is continuous and they satisfy these uh, more type condition. So this is uh, the natural conditions to obtain um, C1 alpha estimates in the interior, okay? When you have a non-trivial right-hand side. I wanna notice that this is, so the asking this condition is less than requiring, requiring higher continuity. For example, if F is bounded or in LP for P greater than N, this is satisfied for, for some alpha, okay? And then in addition, we also require another condition for the operators, since we allow them to be different from each side of the interface, we need a closeness condition, which is given by this, by this um, inequality here. Theta is a universal parameter, so it only depends on the dimension and the electricity constants. Okay. And this is the, the main result that we show. If we have a bounded viscosity solution of the fully nonlinear transmission problem, then U plus and U minus are going to be C1 alpha to the interface, um, a little bit more in the interior, so in, in B1 half. And we have the following control of the C1 alpha norm. So again, it depends on the C1 alpha norm of the interface, L infinity norm of U, Helder norm of G, and these constants that appear here for the right-hand side, okay? Now, um, like I said, so if we, if we ask for this condition for the function um, F, then we know by the results of Caffarelli Cabré that in the interior, okay, in the interior of its domain locally, uh, viscosity solutions are C1 alpha, okay? And so really here, the, the challenging thing or the interesting thing is to prove um, that the estimate holds at the interface. So what is the strategy? Let me give you a little bit more of, of detail. We can assume that the origin is on gamma, the normal vector there is a vector EN, so the vertical vector, and G of zero is equal to one, okay? And this is just by by a scaling argument, translating and, and rotating the coordinates. Now, giving a small parameter epsilon, we can normalize the problem so that 
all of these quantities are less than or equal to epsilon, okay? So in particular, this says that the interface gamma, it's like epsilon flat, G is close to one, and the, the right-hand side is close to zero in, in some sense. And so our idea is, well, if gamma is epsilon, epsilon flat, we can trap gamma between two planes that are epsilon close, okay? Now let's look, for example, at the plane from, from below, and let's solve the following transmission problem. So let's call V the solution to this flat interface problem with transmission condition equals to one. So that means G equals one here, okay? Then full nonlinear equation here with right-hand side zero, full nonlinear equation here with right-hand side zero, and V equals to U on the boundary of V1. Then you see we have two problems that are very close to each other. So if we have some sort of maximum principle, we expect the solution V to this flat interface problem to be close, epsilon close to the solution U. Okay, and that's the idea. And so then again, by just uh, um, rescaling and iterating this process, we can transfer the regularity of the solution V to the function U. So there's three key ingredients in this uh, strategy for it to work. The first key ingredient is we, sh we have to be able to, um, to construct solutions to flat interface problems. And this is something that, that we do following Perron's method, okay? So here, the, the main difficulty is to show that we have a, a comparison principle for this type of, of uh, equations and, and this problem. And then uh, the C1 alpha regularity of the flat interface solutions was uh, followed by the result of the Silva Ferrari sal. So what it remains to show is that we have a maximum principle. And this is what I, what I will discuss next. The maximum principle in the context of fully nonlinear equations is also known as the ABP estimate or Alexandrov Backelman Pucci estimate. First, a couple of definitions. We define the Pucci extremal operators this way. Okay, so the Pucci minus. Um, so here, when you see the sub index plus and sub index minus, this denotes the positive part and the negative part. Okay. And we also define the Pucci class of sub solutions as super solutions the following way. For example, the Pucci class of sub solutions with right hand side f is a set of continuous functions, u, such that u satisfies this inequality in the viscosity sense. Or in other words, u is a viscosity subsolution to the Pucci plus equation with, with right hand side equal to f. So the, the ABP estimate that we show for our transmission problems is the following. If u is in the Pucci class of super solutions, and satisfies this uh, super solution inequality for the transmission condition, then we can control the supremum of the negative part of U in, in the entire unit ball by the supremum of the negative part on the boundary of the ball plus some um, universal constant times all of the data, right? So um, the maximum of, of G, the positive part of G on gamma and the Allen norm of the right-hand side. So what is the, the idea of the proof? We follow similar techniques as in the classical approach, but we encounter one main difficulty that, that we need to overcome. So let me first uh, remind you briefly what is the classical approach. Here we can always assume that the infimum of u on the boundary is not negative, okay? And the negative part is not trivially zero. Then the negative part is going to be zero on the boundary, right? And by continuity, the supremum of the negative part will be attained in V1 at some point x naught. Then the idea is we can extend the, the function u minus by zero outside of V1, let's say to the closure of V2. And we consider psi the convex envelope of minus u minus on the closure. So minus u, not u minus is this blue graph that you can see. And the convex envelope is the largest convex function that lies below the blue function, okay? Now, if we can show that the convex envelope is C11 on the closure of B2, then in particular, um, psi will be second order differentiable almost everywhere. And so we can apply the area formula for Lipschitz maps to the gradient of the convex envelope. So using that formula, we can uh, we find a bound from above of the measure of the set of gradients okay, by the integral over the set 
of second order differentiability points of the determinant of the Hessian of, of psi. And then with some extra effort, one can see that, so one can find a bound from below of the measure of the set of gradients, okay, using some um, geometric argument. And using the, the fact that U is a super solution, one can also find a bound from above of the determinant of the Hessian of the convex envelope by the positive part of F to the power N. And this is, of course, almost everywhere. So at those points where, where this is well, well defined. Yes, of course. <laughs> no. You could have, yeah, if the, if the blue function is uh, maybe like constant at some point. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That is fine. Okay. So then, what is the, the main difficulty that, that we encounter in, in our problem? Well, the thing is that in principle, the convex envelope could touch the minus u minus, so the blue function, at a point on the interface gamma. Okay. And so, like I said, here we're prescribing a jump between the normal derivatives, so there's going to be an angle and so the the convex envelope could be singular at those points okay. now to avoid that the idea is well if this angle instead of being convex so instead of being like that it's like that so we flip it, it's kind of concave then the convex envelope is not going to touch at those points right okay so the idea is to modify this blue function in a way that we flip this angle so we do not touch over there and then we're good and so for that we construct a barrier w that's not negative and look at the difference u minus w and we want the difference to satisfy the super solution and uh, it satisfies the transmission condition inequality with zero here okay so removing so flipping the angle means removing g from the transmission condition as such having a strict um, zero here Okay, and so that way we can assure that we do not touch V at those points where it might be singular. So for example, to give you an idea here, if the function, so if the, if the interface is, is, is a plane, then the function W looks like this, okay? So it's the absolute value of Xn, which is, uh, gives, gives us a non-trivial uh, difference of normal derivatives and some large constant that's larger than G that we'll be able to remove this, this G from the transmission condition. Now, in general, if we have a C1 alpha interface, then, oh, I spoiled you, the future directions. Okay, so in general, if we have a C1 alpha interface, to be able to control uh, from below the, the difference between the normal derivatives, we use a Hobbes lemma for, for the Pucci class that was proved by, by Lian and Zhang in 2020. So once we have all of these ingredients, or once we have this, this function, we can follow the classical proof for the function V and then transfer the, the estimate for, for you. Okay, that's the, the idea. Now, some of the current and, and future work about this problem, existence of viscosity solutions is an open problem in the case of non-flat interfaces. And uh, here I would say that the challenging thing to, to prove is the, the comparison principle. Also with Pablo right now, we are finishing the last details of uh, the situ alpha regularity. So in this case, if we have a convex or concave operator and the interface is, is situ alpha. And finally, I think it'd be interesting to study maybe the X-dependence case. So what would happen if we have an operator that not only depends on the fashion of U, but also on a point X. Okay, so this concludes the first part. Are there any questions so far or? Okay, great. So let's move on to part two. This is a completely different uh, topic and it's about a new family of interdifferential operators that are related to the, to the Mont Ampere equation. And this is joint work with, with Luis Caffarelli that has been 
uh, submitted for, for publication. All right, so let's start with the motivation. The classical Montjamper equation prescribes the determinant of the Hessian of a function u. And this equation has brought a lot of attention uh, due to its many applications, right? So for example, the problem, problem of optimal trans mass transportation or the problem of prescribing the Gaussian curvature of some surface. Now, the question that um, motivates our problem is the following. How can we define a non-local analog of this Montjamper operator? In the literature, there's two different types of definitions that are motivated by, by this linear algebra identity. So let's say we have a function u that is C2 at a point x, such that the Hessian is non-negative at that point. Then we, we can compute the determinant of the Hessian to the power one over n. So this is the, the Montjamper operator. And we get that this Montjamper operator is equal to the infimum over the set of matrices that are positive definite with the terminal equal to one of the trace of A transpose Hessian U times A. Okay, so in other words, the Montjamper operator is a concave envelope of linear operator. And then uh, by a simple computation, we can obtain the second identity, which gives us a representation in terms of the Laplacian of linear transformations of U. So now to define an unlocal analog, um, Luis Caffarelli and, and Fernando Charro consider a very natural approach, which is to replace the Laplacian by the fractional Laplace. Okay. As you can see over here, and just using the, the integral representation of the fractional Laplacian, they obtain this expression. So this is uh, understood in the principal value sense. And uh, you see here, this operator is the infimum of integral differential operators where the kernels are linear transformation of, of the kernel of the fractional Laplace. Now, among many other things, they show that if U is convex and asymptotically linear, and S is between one half and one, then the normalized non-local Montjamper converges to the second order classical Montjamper operator as S approaches one. Okay, so this is a um, non-local analog of the Montjamper operator. Now, a different approach, that's actually the one that we're interested in, was given by Luis Caffarelli and, and Luis Silvestre, which is the, the following. So here they consider as well the non-local Montjamper operator as an infimum of interdifferential operator. But in this case, the kernels satisfy this type of condition. So the measure of the level set is equal to the measure of the ball of radius R for any radius R. Now, here is a picture of uh, giving the geometric interpretation of this condition. Um, so let's say in R3, we take the kernel of the fractional Laplacian, okay? And we compute what is this level set. So this is precisely the ball of radius R. So then we can modify the ball in any way that we want, so as long as we um, preserve the volume of the ball, okay? So that's what this is standing on. Now, a few remarks. By construction, we have that these kernels and the fractional Laplacian kernel have the same distribution function. Also, the kernels considered by Caffarelli Charro are in this family because um, here the level sets, they are going to be ellipsoids that preserve the, the volume of the ball because the determinant is equal to one. So in particular, this family is larger than the family considered by Caffarelli Charro. And so when we take the infimum, when we take the infimum um, over this family of kernels, we see that the Montjamper, so the Caffarelli Silvestre non local Montjamper is smaller than the Caffarelli Charro, which is smaller than the fractional Laplace. Okay. Now, since we're interested in, in this paper, let me briefly tell you um, a problem that they study. So, Luis Caffarelli and, and Luis Silvestre consider the following global Poisson problem. Here, phi is a smooth strictly convex function that uh, is asymptotically linear. So this means that far away it behaves like a cone. And they wanna find a solution to this equation in, in Rn, so in the full space, such that u converges to the function phi um, at infinity. Okay? Now you see this operator here is well-defined when u is C11, point y is well-defined. Now, um, typically, if you want to, to prove existence, it's easier if you ask for, for less regularity of, of the function. And they are able to do that. So they give a, um, a new definition that, only, that works for only continuous functions that are convex, 
okay? So this is very important. Because the idea is, if the function is convex, we can replace the, the gradient of u by a vector in the subdifferential, and then take the supreme. Now, this new definition is consistent with the previous one, because if you see one one, the subdifferential is just the gradient of u. Okay, so they both coincide. The main theorem that they show is that there is a unique convex solution of the Poisson problem that C11 with this control of the C11 semi norm. Okay. And the idea of the proof is uh, first they show that the comparison principle holds for these equations. And then they, they prove that the largest subsolution is the solution. So they, they follow Perron's method and in proof, so they show that the solution is C11 using some barrier argument. Yes. Yeah, so it's a smooth, this is strictly convex and asymptotically linear. Okay. Um, all right, so the, the two key ingredients of the proof are, first of all, they need to construct some barriers to be able to, to um, carry out the Ron's method. And they show that phi is a subsolution to this equation. And this is because when you plug it in for you here, you see the right hand side becomes zero. And the non-local mont ampere is, is not negative for convex functions by construction. And then to show uh, that phi plus some perturbation of phi that's given by this expression is a super solution, they use the fact that the non-local mont ampere is bounded from above by the fractional Laplace. So once you have a subsolution and a super solution, you know if you have a comparison principle that the solution is going to be trapped in between. Okay. And so to show that the largest subsolution is in fact a solution they prove this uh, new representation formula using the level set. Okay, so this function mu sub p is a measure of this uh, sub-level set of u minus some supporting plane. Okay, now what is the problem that, that, we, that we study with Louis? So our goal is to find an intermediate family of operators that are given by infimum of interdifferential operators, okay, of this form bounded from below by the non-local mont ampere and from above by the fractional Laplace. And what we wanna do it in a way that uh, they connect these two operators in some um, reasonable manner. And the idea is to construct this family of kernels using the, the similar approach, uh, geometric approach as the one given in the paper by Caffarelli and, and Silvestre. So let's look at a, at a picture of a possible um, family of operators in R3, okay? So in R3, we have on one side the fractional Laplacian. We consider this to be a rigid operator because the kernel is just this one. We're not doing anything to, to this kernel. On the other um, side, we have an unlocal mont ampere. And here, remember that we are doing volume preserving deformations to the level sides of the kernel, okay? So we are deforming in any direction. So between not doing anything to, to the kernels here and deforming in any direction, there's two intermediate things that we can do. The first thing is just doing length preserving deformations in one direction. So that means, let's say we fix the direction E1, okay, this horizontal direction, and we, we know to create a new admissible kernel, we need to modify the, the ball, right? So we, we restrict the ball to parallel lines to E1. So let's look, for example, at this segment. Now, what would be a length preserving deformation? Well, for example, we can partition the, the segment into two shift one um, piece to the left and the other piece to the right. Okay? So that's uh, one, one possible construction. Now a different type of operator, so this is F1, F2 would be considering area preserving deformations. So in this case, we fix two directions, let's say E1 and E2, and we slice the ball, okay, with horizontal planes, and every slice we modify it in a way that we preserve the area, as you can see over here. Okay? So this is an example of a family of operators in, in R3. Now, what is the precise definition? In general, the family of, uh, so given K between one and strictly less than N, the, the family of admissible kernels is defined as the following way. So we, we ask that the measure in our K, Kz is fixed of these level sets is equal to the measure in our K of the ball of radius R restricted to the plane at level D. Okay, so if the plane cuts the ball, this is a non-trivial measure that we get. If the plane does not cut the ball, then we obtain zero. And so we define the intermediate operators 
um, this way. So you see here, the expression is the same as the one considered for the non-local multi operator. What changes really is where we are taking the input. Okay, so this family here. And this operator is well-defined when you see one, one convex, and we have some growth control at, at infinity so that the integral uh, is finite. And so in particular, in this case, this number will be non-negative and, and finite, okay? And also by construction, so this parameter K is the number of directions that we consider to make this deformation. So the more directions we take, the more kernels we'll be able to, to construct. And so this, this uh, family of kernels is increasing, but then when we take the infimum, the, the, we obtain a monotone decreasing family, right? So the infimum could be smaller. And so this is what we obtain. So it's a family, a monotone decreasing family of operators that are trapped between the local Montamper and the fractional Laplace. Okay, so now that we have our definition, what are some of the problems that we study? Uh, well, for example, one interesting question would be when and where is the infimum attained, right? Also, what is the limit as this approach is one? Um, because we have done the construction from the non-local side, so what happens um, what local operator do we obtain when we pass to the limit? And what is the regularity of, of this function? So for the first question, what is the, when do we um, attain the, the infimum? Here I introduce some, some notations to simplify the, the expression. And this is uh, the result that we, that we obtain, the main result for, for the first question. So assuming that the measure of these sub-level sets of the function u tilde, that's given by essentially u minus its tangent plane at x naught. If this measure is finite, then we find a measure preserving transformation, sigma, such that this uh, function is represented by the following integral. Okay. So, in other words, the infimum is attained at this kernel over here. And let me recall um, what's a measure preserving transformation. It has to satisfy the following condition. So, for any measurable set in, in the in the range, the, the um, measure of the pre-image in RK is equal to the measure of the set in RL. Now, what is the idea of the proof? Well, we want to find a kernel here that minimizes this integral. Now we know this is not negative because U is convex, right? And this is not negative, the kernel is just by construction. And so to minimize this integral, we want to find so we want to have the largest values of u coinciding with, well, with the smaller values of, of k, right? And so this, this uh, sigma function has to do um, in, in a way, um, the way the level sets of, of u tilde are, are rearranged in some sense. So let me, let me tell you uh, very briefly what are the main tools from the theory of, of rearrangement that, that we use. Okay, so if we have a function that's not negative and measurable, the decreasing rearrangement is given by this expression here. Okay, so we have super star and it's defined for T non negative. And also the increasing rearrangement denoted by a sub star given by this expression, and it's defined as well for, for T non negative. Then the first key ingredient that we need for the proof is this Hardy Littlewood type inequality, which says that if we have two non negative functions, F and G, the integral of their product is bounded from below by the integral of the increasing rearrangement of f times the decreasing rearrangement of g. Okay. And so using this inequality, we find a bound from below of the infimum of our operator in terms of the, the increasing rearrangement of the function u tilde and the decreasing rearrangement of the kernel k. Now, to show that the infimum is in fact attained, we need a second tool, which is this celebrated result by Reef which gives a sufficient condition for the, for the, rear, the, the rearrangement function to be able to recover the original function f in terms of its increasing rearrangement uh, via some measure preserving transformation. Okay, so we, we use this result for the function u tilde and that's why this uh, sigma appears. So it's the way the, the level sets are rearranged. Okay, so an interesting consequence of this result is the following. Under the same assumptions, we can express these um, operators as the fractional Laplacian of the k symmetric increasing rearrangement of the function u tilde evaluated at zero. Okay, so a priori we didn't know what they were doing, and this is telling us, well, this is what's happening to the function u. And here, let me remind the, the definition of the k symmetric increasing rearrangement. 
but it's also known in the in the literature by the the sign of symmetrization. And the third question was, well, what is the limit? As I approach one, we show that under nice condition, the limit is the sum of uh, Monjamper operators restricted to R k. Okay, so this is a second order Monjamper operator in R k plus uh, Laplacian in R n minus k. Okay, so with respect to the last n minus k variable. Now, what is um, the, the geometric interpretation of these two of this decomposition? So but going back to this picture in R3 and, and K equals two, we see that um, at every slice, we were doing an area preserving deformation. So looking down here at the plane, this is like a monjamper operator in R2, right? So it's a deformation that preserves area. Now, vertically, we're not doing any modification, okay? And so that's like a rigid operator like, like the Laplacian. So monjamper in R2 and Laplacian in R2. In, with respect to the third variable, let's say. All right, so the last thing that I, a couple of last things. So first, what is the, the regularity of these uh, intermediate operators? Well, when you see one, one, um, and this is between one half and one, we know that the fractional Laplacian is Kelder continuous with exponent two minus two S. Also, Caffarelli and, and Silvestre show that the non-local Montampere is uh, also Kelder continuous locally with exponent one minus S, okay? um via some uh, geometric argument and you see this exponent when s is greater than one half or less than one is better it's greater than this one over here so we obtain the the same regularity as in a local montampere because heuristically these operators are like a decomposition between fractional laplacian and a local montampere and so the better regularity that we can hope for is the, the words between these, these two okay and now, yes, the last thing that I wanted to mention is that once we, we know um, a little bit more these operators and we have studied some of their properties, we also study a global Poisson problem, okay? Which is um, the same type of problem that Cafarelli and Silvestre study. And we follow... <laughs> yes, that was the last step of the, <laughs> of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we follow similar geometric ideas as in their paper, and perhaps one of the of the main differences is um, I, I mentioned that one key ingredient is a representation formula using the level set. Okay, and in this case, we are able to obtain a formula like that for the intermediate operators. Um, unfortunately, it's not as pretty, um, and this is because of the the lack of symmetry that we have in our construction. So we have this integral here with respect to r minus k. And, um, and this weight function. But in any case, having this formula allows us to, to um, follow a similar procedure as in the paper of Caffarelli Silvestre. Yes. <laughs> well, it's not maybe as clean as their formula, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it, <laughs> it works, it works. <laughs> um, all right, so yeah, thank you all for your attention. And I also wanted to, to thank all the people that have made my, my experience in Austin uh, so much, so much better. Uh, my family and, and my friends, thank you so much.